We welcome you to our continuing roundtable discussion of the Book of Mormon. Today we're going to be handling chapters 33 through 35 of the Book of Alma. I'm Victor Ludlow, a professor of ancient scripture at BYU, and I have three good colleagues here with me today as we discuss these uh, important chapters. We have Stan Johnson here to my left. We have two Terrys, Terry Ball and Terry Swink. We welcome you, and we're just glad to discuss some of these things here together. Uh, we're going to start off here with chapter 33, which uh, is a continuation of Alma's uh, and Amulek's work among the Zoramites. Uh, where are we coming from and where are we going in this material here? Terry, help us out. Well, chapter 3 is kind of a continuation of the dialogue that Alma is having with the poor and the humble of the Zoramites. Do you remember in chapter 32, he gives this beautiful explanation of how one acquires faith, likening the development of faith to the planting of a seed and, and raising it to a tree that you harvest a fruit of. And oh, and the last part of it, the, the, the sweetness and the whiteness and the, oh, a very powerful yeah. fruit that he promises, yes. And, and when he's done, the people have some questions. And so they come in verse 1 of chapter 33 asking the questions. Now after Alma had spoken these words, they sent forth unto him desiring to know whether they should believe in one God that they might obtain the fruit of which he had spoken or how they should plant the seed or the word which he had spoken, which he said must be planted in their hearts or in what manner that they should begin to exercise faith. So he's, you know, he said gaining faith is like planting a seed. Now they ask, how do we plant the seed? We want to do this experiment upon the word. And so I like to look at the rest of this chapter 33 as him giving examples of how one goes about planting the seed. Uh, for example, in verse 3, he says, Do you remember to have read what Zenos the prophet of old has said concerning prayer? Mm -hmm. And you know, that's an important part of planting the seed. You, you've got to be praying. Um, turn the page. What else? Without even looking, you could probably guess what the next one is. If you were telling your children what you have to do to begin to exercise faith, to plant the seed, you'd probably list what he does in verse, um, verse 12 and 13 and 14. Um, verse 14, I would ask if you've read the scriptures. So you've got to be praying. You've got to be reading the scriptures. And then um, the third thing he presents, with an interesting analogy, he talks about how uh, Moses raised up the brazen serpent when they were in the this wilderness. Act of faith. Yeah, and if they would look to the serpent, they would be healed. And a lot of them didn't obey. And the point is, you have to read the scriptures, you have to be praying, but you also have to obey. That's a, that's a good formula for planting the seed and gaining faith, I think. Well, let's start off and talk, first of all, about some of this insight that Zenos, this prophet of old, we just don't know how much earlier. Of course, by this period of time, we're way past, you know, five centuries into the new land, and Zenos was on the brass plates. Concerning prayer or worship, I, I like that, that prayer is a genuine part of our worship, and as we do that on our Sabbath and in our families. Uh, it's a type of, 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 of devotion. And uh, I, I like uh, the, uh, the structure that uh, is, is a part of this. Well, I, I call it almost like a poem on prayer here. He starts off by addressing, uh, you know, I was in the wilderness, you know, some place where you feel like you're in a hostile, foreign environment or whatever. And then I prayed unto him in, uh, in my field. Well, there you are in a little more familiar territory. You're close to home. And then in verse 6, in my home, you know. So now you're in a really a nice, safe, secure environment. 
And then to be even more special and private, even within my closet or my storeroom. Uh, That's an interesting paradigm. I never hadn't noticed that. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah so it's all, I think it's great counsel for the, the Zoramites too, because remember these the poor Zoramites have been excluded from worshiping in the synagogue, and so they they had to understand that you, you didn't have to, to to go to the church to pray. You could pray anywhere, and I I I really appreciate that. One of the, the best places I found a prayer. This may sound crazy, but uh, there was a, I was teaching a class up in Salt Lake, and I had to drive up there. 45 minutes, and instead of listening to the radio, I, I used to turn the radio off and and just pray as I drove along the car. I didn't close my eyes, you know. That. But everyone else around you was praying too <laughs> while you were driving, right? <laughs> and and I just I just found that that this this when I got to to after praying in the car for the full 45 minutes, the class there were some of the best classes I've ever had, and 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 that's a lesson we. we I think sometimes we think we have that the formal prayers are the most important. When I think the the individual prayers where we open up our hearts and pour them out to God, I think those are the most important prayers that we can offer. And that's, I think that's one of the things that Zenus is teaching right here. I, I just read an article by President uh, Irie, and he mentioned the key to having the Spirit, to being able to do the will of the Father, is to uh, daily search the Scriptures and pray the, the prayer of faith. He said, there's your key. And I think that's what we've got here, the prayer of faith and uh, the study of the scriptures. I I also like uh, this idea of uh, verse 4 and 5, right at the first, thou art merciful. Verse 5, thou wast merciful. Speaking of of God, verse 8, thou art merciful. Verse 9, right at the first, thou has been merciful. Mm -hmm. Then you go to verse 11, and 13 and 16, uh, right at the end of it, exactly the same words, because of thy son, because of thy son, because of thy son. And uh, I heard a a good friend say, if you really want to know what's important in the scriptures, note those things that are repeated. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, that's the message of the book, that uh, we can uh, come unto our Father in heaven and receive... uh, all of his blessings because of the Son. There's also another little paradigm in here that uh, I find of interest. In verse 8, he's talking about thy children and, and talking about using some terms that we think of with family. And then in verse 9, you've heard my cries in the midst of thy congregations, or we would say when we're you know, at church or among friends, and then he goes on and, and talks again about enemies that haven't been so softened as the earlier ones that were mentioned. And so we, we have different family and social circumstances as well that should be incorporated within our prayers. Well, any other discussion here on, 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 on this little uh, verses... Uh, what do we have here? Four through eleven here. Uh, summarize and concluding, as you said, Stan, uh, thou hast turned thy judgments from it because of thy son. And then he addresses the group and says, do you believe these things? Well, then remember, he has said, thou hast turned away thy judgments because of thy son. And he's, he's then ready to shift to a new set of instructions uh, moving from the teachings of the scriptures, but be- basically to teach him about the Son of God. And he mentions another prophet from the brass plates, but we learn something new about this prophet besides some of his teachings in this passage. Do you recall? Is this where he was stoned? Yeah, this where no. it talks about where at the end of verse 17 that the people would not understand his words and they stoned him to death him. Right. so that this Zenus uh, or Zenic excuse me uh, whoever he was who was also on the brass plates uh, was, a, was a martyr for for his testimony and then another prophet Moses and so here's Alma a prophet using other prophets th- three different types of prophets uh, Moses became a translated being uh, had special callings as well. And uh, how does he 
bring in Moses here to the to to these Zoramites? What's he trying to use Moses for? The context is teaching of Christ, isn't it? And the importance of obeying him. You know, Bob Matthews used to tell me all the time, he said, the beauty of the Book of Mormon is it tells you the why. The Bible tells you what happened. The Book of Mormon tells you why. And here's a good example of that. The Bible tells us that Moses raised up the brazen serpent, and if the people would look to the serpent, they would be, they would be healed and not die. But the Book of Mormon tells us why, that it says in verse 19, Behold, a type was raised in the wilderness. And we're, we know that that type is Christ. And if you look to Christ, you are healed. And really the idea that, uh, you know, you need to do it quickly, not be slothful. Um, there, there's a lot of messages there uh, in that metaphor. And uh, cast your eyes uh, about and, and put your trust in him. And, and you know, that, that 32, we talked about that seed, you plant the seed. And often it's interesting to discuss what is that seed? that you plant in your heart in verse 22 and 23, I think answers it. Yep. Uh, maybe well, I could re re read, read it. it. Yeah. Please. So here's what you plant. Here's the seed. If so, woe uh, come unto you. But if not so, then come cast your eyes, begin to believe in the Son of God, that he will come to redeem his people, that he shall suffer and die uh, to atone for their sins, and that he shall rise again from the dead, which shall bring to pass the resurrection that all men shall stand before him to be judged at the last uh, at the last and judgment day according to their works and now my brethren i desire that ye shall plant this word in your hearts and as it beginneth to swell even so nourish it by your faith and behold, it will be a tree springing up in you unto each everlasting life. And then may God grant unto you that your burdens may be light through the joy of his Son. And even, even all this can ye do if ye will. Amen. So he's basically in that verse there, just summarized the highlights of chapter 32. The idea of preparing your heart and your soul, uh, asking, planting the seed, nourishing it. You, you'll, you'll feel it swelling. You know it's a good seed, but you need to get the plant growing. And then eventually you get to taste the fruit, the and sweet it's, fruit. It's interesting that then in, in producing this tree, he refers back to, to Lehi's dream of the tree of life. I mean, this, he's obviously making reference to this tree that, where the fruit is white and delicious to the taste, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. It, it, it tells you that, that Alma's, not only does he, he tell us to read the scriptures, but he himself has read the scriptures. He's familiar with these stories. And so he's able to take this lesson about the seed and turn it into uh, a reference back to Lehi's uh, Dream of the Tree of Life. Good. Now adding to the prophetic words of Alma and Zenus and Zenik and uh, the, the example to be learned from Moses, we got another witness coming up here in chapter 34. Uh, where we have uh, another uh, witness, uh, Alma's companion, Amulek, uh, testifies. What, what, what do we remember about Amulek and his background? He was actually, um, became his companion after Alma was first rejected by, by these people, as you recall. And, and the Lord told him to go back, and he went back, and Amulek, the Lord had prepared Amulek to send a messenger to, and, and prepared Amulek to, uh, to be his mission companion, if you will. Alma spent several days with him, giving him his MTC experience, I think, teaching mm -hmm. him and preparing him. And I think Amulek learned well, because this just follows a great missionary example. Alma has taught a principle and introduced another concept, the atonement, and now Amulek's going to step in, mm -hmm. give a second witness to what Alma had taught, and then go into greater detail, telling him a little bit more about the atonement. An, an angel helped him, too. There was That's a, right. a little bit of angelic... Uh, in service. And there's been a lot of service before, uh, some suffering and persecutions right. that they'd experienced with some, an earlier round of missionary work before this one with, with, with the Zoramites. And so he adds his witness, uh, again calling upon Zenus and Moses and others there. 
but teaches some some very profound insight. I think uh, this Amulek, although from what we know of him, he was an up for class, well-respected member of A man of, of no right. small reputation amongst yes. those that know me. I like right. that. that was an <laughs> interesting statement. Yep. But uh, I think he's a very deep thinker uh, and, and has some he, he very almost, profound insights. I'm teaching Paul right now in the New Testament. It reminds me a little bit of Paul, you know, that he really a very talented, gifted individual kind of going the wrong way. And so uh, even an angel gets involved here and uh, Alma and turns him around and so he's ready to go. You can see why Alma would invite uh, Amulek yeah. to come with him to go see the Zoramites after their experience at Ammonihah. Mm -hmm. um, this this yeah. fellow's just right. He's, he gets right to the heart of the matter. Look what he says in verse 5. We beheld that the great question which is in your mind is whether the word be the Son of God or whether be, there shall be no Christ. He, he gets right to the matter. This is the great question. And really this is the great question we all need to ask, you know, it, it refers to Christ. It, do we follow Christ? Do we, or is there someone else? Or he gets right to the yeah, heart of the matter. Does he really have the power to save us or not? Terry, as in Sphinx here, would you read verses 9 and 10 here to highlight some of his teachings about the atonement? Sure. He says, verse 9, For it is expedient that an atonement should be made, for according to the great plan of the eternal God, there must be an atonement made or else all mankind must unavoidably perish. Yea, all are hardened, yea, all are fallen, and are lost, and must perish except it be through the atonement which is expedient that should be made. For it is expedient that there should be a great and last sacrifice, yea, not a sacrifice of man, neither of beast, neither of any manner of fowl. For it shall not be a human sacrifice, but it must be an infinite and eternal sacrifice. Not a, be a human sacrifice, but an infinite and eternal sacrifice. Infinite and eternal are often used as a descriptive phase for, the, for God, for the divine. It has to be a, a divine type of sacrifice. Any normal mortal, any normal animal sacrifice, the likes of which they have been doing for centuries under the Mosaic Law, those were foreshadows or prototypes. Uh, these were to teach him and prepare him. But, and we're still some 70 odd years away from Jesus' birth, almost a century away from this actual atonement taking place. But it has to be this divine being to bring forth this I like atonement. What President Benson says that he was a God in the flesh. And so Emmanuel. It is a, a human sacrifice. It really is a sacrifice of a God. And, and the very, it's interesting, he says, an infinite and eternal sacrifice, infinite in that it's not bound by time. I mean, this, this, the atonement is, is covering the sins of these men who are living before the, the atonement even takes place. In mm -hmm. other words, the atonement it isn't just from the time it, it's accomplished forward, but it expends, ex, exp, extends back into to the past, into the future. Time and space. Time and space. It's, it is truly infinite and eternal. You know, he's answered two really fundamental questions about the atonement in those verses. Verse 9, why does there have to be an atonement? Because if there wasn't, all mankind would perish. Second, what kind of atonement or who could work the atonement? It mm -hmm. has to be an infinite mm -hmm. and eternal atonement. Why Christ? It has to be Christ because he is infinite and eternal. And he it, answers some other really important questions about the atonement in this chapter as well. This has got to be one of the most brilliant discourses on the atonement in all Scripture. As he just kind of answers all the question, why, who, when, how. And, and brings it here in the next verses, uh, the different laws that are fulfilled. And these laws have certain requirements. We may try to avoid them, but eventually justice has to be satisfied. And God is a God of justice. Well, but he's also a God of mercy, but mercy can't rob justice. And so somehow or another, this atoning sacrifice has to fulfill, well, as he calls it here in verse 16, the demands of justice, but also these hopes and prayers and expectations of mercy that in spite of our weaknesses, justice can be satisfied because there is someone else there to, to meet its demands where we couldn't do it in and of ourselves. Right. I love the Book of Mormon for that reason, that whenever it talks about the fall, our fallen condition, it always, in the next verse or two, talks about the atonement. And justice is here and mercy is here. And uh, they're right next to each other, and it's beautifully done throughout the book. 
And then after it explains the fall, the atonement, it always makes sure it tells you how to make the atonement work. Yeah. And, I, and that's what he's doing in 17 yeah. through 31 here. Oh, yeah. you get the full benefit of the atonement. Look at the list here he presents of things that you do to make the atonement work. Verse 17, you exercise faith and repentance. Mm -hmm. You begin to call upon his holy name that he would have mercy upon you. So, And call, call, call. You mentioned mm -hmm. repetition. Mm -hmm. I mean, the word mm -hmm. call... Uh, shows up uh, uh, eight times. I yeah. mean, cry, right. uh, cry, and call, cry unto him here and there, and with this need and that need. <laughs> like Alma, well, Zenus's words quoted earlier: mm -hmm. different places, different circumstances. Keep petitioning. Mm -hmm. So, so you you have faith in verse seventeen. You call or pray in verse seventeen. Verse nineteen. You have to humble yourselves, mm -hmm. and then uh, verse twenty-eight and twenty-nine. You have to care for the needy, visit the sick. As it's summarized in verse 29, you have to be charitable. Think about that. Mm -hmm. That's a good formula for a, a, applying the atonement. Faith, and prayer, yeah. and humility, and loving, serving others. Mm -hmm. And some have seen in these, uh, particularly verses 20 through 20, well, actually 18 through 27 here, a little poetic pattern, mm -hmm. a chiasmus, with the pivot point being here in verses 22, 23. Yea, cry unto him against the power of your enemies. Yea, cry unto him against the devil, who is an enemy of righteousness. Reminds me of the famous passage there in Mormon, uh, chapter 9, verse 6, where Mormon is addressing his son Moroni and telling him, in spite of all these things that are happening around us, we have a labor to perform Keep while in this tabernacle of clay to conquer the enemy of righteousness. And yep. if we're not drawing near and crying unto the Lord to help us, we're not going to be able to conquer that enemy yep. of righteousness. Then he talks about when you need to apply the atonement. He tells how, and then talks about when in 32, 33, 34. These are kind of scary verses, aren't they? Yes. <laughs> Do not procrastinate the day of your repentance, we read in verse 33, until it is end, till the end. For after this day of life, which is given us to prepare for eternity, behold, if we do not improve our time while in this life, then cometh the night of darkness, wherein there can be no labor performed. My students always ask, when is that? Mm -hmm. They want it. What do you tell them? Mm -hmm. It's whenever you stop trying. It's, uh, it's not how many times you fall down, they say, that determines success. It's that you get up at least one more time. And I, this night of darkness comes whenever we stop, try. stop trying. Yeah. And uh, we procrastinate and we decide it's no longer important for so us. So it's determined by your attitude rather than the calendar? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Wouldn't they rather have a calendar so you know you could <laughs> right. you have till a Too deadline? Easy. <laughs> Too easy. <laughs> you know, I, I love the word this day. And um, I just to me, um, we've got somebody on our faculty that you know well that's, how you doing? Best day ever. And I used to think, uh, okay, I've heard that now. You don't need to say that anymore. But it occurred to me one day that uh, I walk, there's a little thing in my wall that says, choose you this day whom you sh will serve. But for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And really, this day is all we've got. And, and I think he's making a great point here. You better think about this time and even this day as being it, because once you leave this life, I think there are some serious reflex or restrictions on your ability to repent. That's kind of what he's saying in 34, yeah. isn't it? More the same difficult. spirit that mm -hmm. possesses your body now. Right. I think by spirit he means attitude, right. disposition. Personality. It's going to possess you in the next. It, it sounds like death does not make saints out of sinners. No, That's right. right. If you can't cook before you're married, you can't cook <laughs> after you're married. I mean, you know, you don't all of a sudden, because you're married, uh, become a great cook. Notice I don't say anything about the man. This is... <laughs> <laughs> and now is the time to get things done. Yeah. That's right. <clears throat> Well, Stan, uh, we, we, we come here in, in this next little short chapter. It, it moves from beautiful, profound doctrine and insight, yeah. but we ought to highlight just a little bit here. Uh, these Zoramites, uh, uh, the leaders of them at least, kind of do a survey. They sent messengers around the land here to kind of see what people are thinking about these teachings of Alma and Amulek. What do they do? Well, they, of course, their craft it's is being seri here, seriously <laughs> threatened. Uh, they're a little ram and everything because of the preaching of the word. 
by uh, Alma and Amulek. And so they kind of send a survey out, figure out who's following, who isn't, and they cast them out, Alma and Amulek and all the believers. And uh, we're kind of setting up for a big war here for the next 20 chapters in a while, here in 43 through 63 of Alma. And so you've got them, uh, Jershon, uh, some of them go there. And uh, the Lamanites are ready to attack the Nephites who take over Jershon and the and uh, your, uh, who are your people? The, the poor Zoramites move out to Malek, and we're getting ready for a big war. I appreciate the fact that these people, Jared, remember these are where the, well, many of the Anti Nephi Lehites had settled, these Lamanites mm -hmm. that had come among them. And here they are taking in other refugees, just like they had been refugees. And even when confronted by the Zoramites, don't take them in, cast them out. They refused to bow to that pressure. They, they had people. courage, and they were willing to protect Can't them. Can't be intimidated. Right. You know, it's interesting that these enemies, weren't, it, they weren't happy just throwing out those who believed. Mm -hmm. They wanted to make sure that they were annihilated. Destroyed off in a wilderness where they'd perish or something yeah. like that. Well, what have we learned from, from these few chapters well, here, Stan? I've, I have appreciated our discussion. I've actually learned some good things here. This has been a good experience for me. I, what I've learned, and I think all uh, chapter 33, uh, we learn how to plant the Word. We understand that uh, it takes prayer, and it takes Scripture study, and it takes faith. And, uh, of course, it's only because of the Son that we're able to do this. It's because of His atonement. And that gets us into 34, and we need to plant that word, the infinite and eternal atonement, which is the seed that we plant in our hearts, and it grows up into a, a, a plant uh, springing up into eternal, everlasting life. And uh, finally, how do we do that? And we've got some real basic uh, instruction through prayer and crying for mercy and uh, and that's about all that crosses my mind. Take the blessings and power that come, even if there are going to be social, political uh, ramifications of it. Some powerful words for all of us today. Thank you very much.